my boss said, okay, here are all the programs that we're working on. We got the minivan, we got the new Grand Cherokee, we got the Wrangler, we got the Viper. And this was a small team of five. And he's like, just what do you, what do you guys want? I looked around, I'm like, we're all going to fight over Viper and, and Wrangler, right? And all the other people on my team were like, I don't care. Just take whatever you want. I was like, what? Yeah, that makes this is sense. the Motor City. This is you an auto company. How do you not care? Like, how yeah, do you how care do you... between a Viper and a, what a was minivan? It? The minivan, minivan. Yeah. And then the, the, the KL Cherokee. I'm just like, and then there was the Dart. I'm, I was just like, how is this possible? Welcome to the Autopian Podcast. Yeah. Well, so we can, okay. Should we start ignoring it now, or wait till you get into yes. it? No, just, just I'm. Good. We're sticking to this agenda, Jason. Yes, I know you don't do agendas. Stick very close. Anyway, right. welcome okay, to the agenda Autopian item book. number one. Do we have a name for this yet? Not really. We're going to call it the Autopian Podcast for now. I like that. It's good. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> named after. <laughs> That's um, what it is. It is what it says. Yeah. Exactly. It's right. Right on the label. Podcast. Named yeah. after the Autopian, the greatest car website oh, in the world. This, we can say it. Mankind. This dog's breath is so bad. It's like if you could do the lutefisk process to dog shit. It's so bad. Jason, oh. Jason we're, we were just getting going. Does he eat his own shit? No, she doesn't normally, but she, she'll she indulge in a cat turd occasionally. Just for a little uh, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> but she's Better scared now because it's the, there's a store. All right, sorry. Oh, go ahead, David. Hug. This okay, is okay. Well, agenda. agenda. Okay, welcome to the Autopian Podcast. <laughs> we're going to talk about car. We're going to talk about all sorts of things car-related. Yes. Uh, until we just can't do it anymore. So, um, no, but it's not just like going to be graphics. So like, ooh, yeah, we'll have a thing. Yeah. yeah, we'll swoop in some crap and throw cars up and explosions. <laughs> okay. Great. Today's agenda, which we're going to somewhat be, be strict on, not really. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about what this podcast is, what we're trying to do, what the whole point is, um, okay. what each of us brings to the table here, That's including the dog Abby. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about the is that news, Abby recent normal? news. <laughs> kind of she is only three-legged so oh she is a little bit normal, abby normal. So yeah, yeah. Dog. um <laughs> anyway we're gonna talk about news some exciting news recently hyundai has been really killing it uh yeah. and then we're gonna talk about what we've recently driven or purchased uh then we're gonna have a little segment called hot takes we got a couple of hot takes we gotta talk about and then uh and then we'll talk about what's next a lot of exciting things are happening at big. the utopian uh so it's gonna it's gonna big get stuff. real yeah, that was it's exciting. Real. All right. So what are we starting with, David? We I start with the intro. Oh, intro, didn't we right. Start? Yeah, yeah the, it's, what, what exactly what is this podcast? This is a podcast devoted toward car culture. It's we are we are pro car. We love cars. We, are very we understand they're complex, uh, but we love them. Uh, yeah. we love the auto industry. And I, just just do it. We really have to point out that we like cars and that we I, love cars and we're pro cars. I, weirdly, I, I think we kind of do. I, I, we yeah. kind of do now. It's kind of weird. Yeah. A place we used to work for recently ran a, another ban cars based article. And I don't think we're ever going to say that. I know I, I, it doesn't mean that. cars are perfect, I, but we're not going to, we yeah. don't want to ban them ever. That would kind of go against what we're doing here, right? Yeah. That would be, yeah. Why don't I know why we'd do that? That'd be yeah. like, yeah, like, all right, nobody... so we're pro car. We got that. Yep. Okay. And here are a couple of things we're going to talk about in this podcast. Um, we're going to talk about a, a lot of history stuff. So Bo and Jason, when they get to talking about mm -hmm. car history, it never stops. I'm going to try to, like, you know, referee it to make sure it doesn't go off the rails, but it, you're going to see a lot of that. It's good stuff. Uh, there's going to be plenty of car engineering here. I'm going to, We're going to try to bring in some automotive engineers, suspension engineers, electric vehicle engineers to just get nerdy. I can't wait for that. We um, got a list of experts so long. I don't know if the people fully understand how deep our list of hardcore engine nerds is. It's deep and rich. It is very ridiculously deep. Do you still keep it like where I can somewhat understand what you guys are talking about? I can't make any promises, Bo. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it's going to be awesome. I can't wait. We're also going to talk about a lot of industry stuff. Um, and, and you know what, those three areas, like, okay, history, probably going to hear a lot from Jason, 
engineering lot for me. Industry and sales, that end, you're going to hear from Bo. Um, and the reason is, let's just talk about our backgrounds. Bo, do you want to start? Oh, just dump it on me like that. I don't know how to start. Where did I start? <laughs> okay. I was... All right. You're, coming, you're going yeah. last then. Jason, oh, yeah. Jason you're, going to talk, you're going to talk a lot about history and just weird design stuff. Um, right. Why? Like, what's your, what's, your, what's your deal, Jason? My deal? It's a good question. Well, like, I, um, I came into this kind of late. I was an uh, artist and designer. Graphic designer was my job for years. I did interface design. I did illustrations. My, my degree is in art history, which is almost useless. But as we're going to talk in the hot takes part today, not 100% useless. You put and, it to use. Yeah, I put, I put it to use. Yeah, and, he does. He does a good job doing for, it. Anybody with an art history degree who is not an art history professor or a docent or at a museum who could say their degree is not a hundred percent useless is that's a colossal triumph, I think. Yeah. So I'm I'm super excited about that. I also have a background in comedy. I used to do sketch comedy and stand up. I once opened for George Carlin a long, long time ago. Wait, wait, uh, you did what for George Carlin? I opened for him. Like there was no, a you did not. I did. I met him. And backstage, he's super you nice. You opened for George Carlin? That's like that's uh, like opening for the Beatles. And yeah, no, right? no, I was. It was amazing. It was when I was uh, at. It was a contest they had when I was in college and all these comics could audition and then three slots were open. If you won, you could open for George Carlin. So I got to open for George Carlin and it was uh, amazing. It was fantastic. That's insane. He was, That's he was so nice too. Backstage, I thought I'd be funny and I was like, oh, Slappy White, I'm a huge fan of yours. Cause you know, Slappy White was like this old school comic. And he was like super funny about it. And he, he's just <laughs> a class act, a hundred percent great guy. Got nothing but good things to say about him. And it was, mm -hmm. it was like a huge crowd. It was a lot of fun. So yeah, so I did uh, stuff that had nothing to do with cars. My dad could barely staple. My family was not into cars, but my dad had a Beetle and I loved that thing. And that's what kind of got me hooked. And I used to go into libraries and look at travel books to try to find pictures of weird cars. And that was like the gateway drug to weird cars. And then it's just, you know, never stopped since. And I've always owned weird cars and had weird cars. And here I am. Yep. Just, just and weird cars. That's what, uh, that, that, what that was your- Better. That was- that the Beetle was the gateway because it did everything differently than all the other, like, you know, when I was growing up, it was like Delta 88s everywhere. And it was punctuated with these Beetles or squarebacks or whatever is there. And they did everything backwards, cooled by air instead of water. And then that made me start looking for other stuff. And pre-internet, it was hard. Like you'd see like a tiny picture in a, like you'd have a picture of Prague in a, in a, in the encyclopedia and there'd be like a little tiny thing at the bottom and then months later you'd finally figure out that's a tatra or that's a renault dauphine or whatever and uh yeah it was yeah the world before the internet right how did people find information that's such crazy. an ass pain but no <laughs> that's also why i'm so excited about like your bathtub car uh, uh -huh. the bathtub hot rod the reason that's exciting to me is because of the, like the five car books at my little local library one was a book of hot rods and the bathtub one was like page one may have been on the cover actually so that's like <laughs> seared so into cool. my head it's like meeting i don't know it's like so it's like meeting like uh George like the lorax or something like that <laughs> like something that you've known i was gonna say the fawns yeah or the fawns either way <laughs> same guy so, anyway so torch and i uh we wrote uh for jalopnik uh, that was our previous job uh, we did that for a combined uh, oof, 16 years, something like that. Yep. Wrote for a lot of folks and um, had a great time. And um, Jason focused on art and comedy. He really blended those two uh, into just hilarious work uh, and incredibly artistic and, and creative stuff. I generally focus on engineering and tech, uh, how cars work. Best um, deep dives in the business from Mr. Tracy. <laughs> yeah, Deepest two dives. The, two for the price of one at the utopian.com. Just know. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's, um, yeah, I used to work for, for uh, Chrysler for a couple of years on the JL Wrangler program, powertrain cooling. So if you have uh, a Wrangler that overheats, um, it was probably, <laughs> I could have done better. You were um, just a child at the time. I, I was. really was. Yeah, I really that's was. the amazing was like, part of the story. 21 years old, but there's no excuse because children... Uh, Children in the armed forces, like 17 year olds are, you know, you know, there's no excuse. You got to get it done. <laughs> it's a weird uh, analogy because I feel like, going, like, like we're, <laughs> we're getting 18 year olds to kill people. So a 21 year old should be able to design a function. Point is system, responsibility. Right? Yeah, 18 year olds got to handle responsibility anyway. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's torching me. No, and, no, and, wait, how look, engineering background and all that. You could have gotten into anything. Why cars? Oh yeah, that's fair. You know, I grew up here, so I right now I'm in Germany. 
Um, I spent, you know, uh, roughly eight of the first 12 years of my life here. And it was during this like incredible period in the, in sort of the European auto industry, like right around 2000 is when I started to, you know, get my, you know, I know the car really... you're about to mention the one that hooked you. I know that. Car. Yeah. Yep. Right around 2000. That's when I started to become really conscious. Everything before that's just like, you know, little toddler running around. I don't know what's going on, but um, you know, I was like 10 years old, 11 years old in our Chevy Astro van with my five brothers with a little disposable camera, taking pictures of cars as we road tripped, usually to battlefields. Cause my dad's really into that. We just do road trips around Europe and I would, we just take pictures and during this era, like 2000, 2001, 2002, think about the cars that were out during this time and were coming out during this time. Like Renault Spider at the time, Opal Speedster was coming out. Uh, and the, the one car that did it for, okay, the Boxer was coming out. The one car for me, the Audi TT, yeah. just hmm. an absolutely, it, it's just beautiful. Especially the the convertible with the roll hoops. Is, oh, I just it's a great looking car. Amazing, TT. Yeah, 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 yeah amazing, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> then the Audi, the Audi A2, which I thought was hideous at the time, but is now cool. Um, there were TVRs coming out. Oh, the, the mm. Ferrari 360 Spider was coming out. The Z3, the Z4 was. It, there was just oh, it was. There were so many sports cars coming out just around the millennium um, that it was impossible not to get hooked. And then we moved to the states, and uh, my dad bought a Jeep, and and it was this was oh, in Kansas. Dad has a Jeep. Huh? I, I'm and seeing then, a pattern here. And then you, you and your brothers used to off road the crap out of that thing, right? That was how well you got the into that side of it. My first off road experience was here in Germany in a, a military base called Hohenfels. There's this, there's this training area called the Box, and it's just a sloppy mud fest. And my dad took my brothers and me to take your kids to work day, you know, and in his Humvee. So there's like oh, six Whoa. of us in the back of a Humvee. We're passing around the heater tube, shoving it under our shirts. And um, he, <laughs> wait, wait, and, wait, wait, back up, back up. So wait, the heater isn't coming out of vents. It's out of a flexible tube. Exactly. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little noticed. corrugated Whoa. one. Yeah, we just pat, pat like a like a freaking bong. It's like take a hit, shove it under there, <laughs> pass it to the next guy. Is that <laughs> standard? Is that how the heat is always done in those things? I is it plug into it a is. suit? Wow. Oh, it, I, I think there is. Wow. Yeah, there is a, a suit plug in. Oh, well, wow. Well, I actually don't know if, it, huh. if there's a plug in, but anyway, that doesn't matter. We, when we got to the States, he bought it. It doesn't Jeep, matter. I want to know yeah. about this. this <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's a fascinating way to distribute heat in <laughs> yes. a car. I think it's kind of amazing. More cars should okay. have it. Like you should have gonna write this and down. a switch for like, I think that would be fantastic. We might, I might have to write an article on this. Yeah, I think you absolutely do. Right a, a suit that hooks into your your heater well, your car on an e think about it on an in? ev which wastes a lot of energy with heat if you ah. could restrict the area to a suit if you had that a jacket genius. with a port think how much less energy you could use yes that's so true why why heat up the whole volume exactly you, just... you don't need it <laughs> oh, i mean genius. yes I'm people would have to put on a special suit before they well you just make it a jacket you just make it a jacket that looks yeah. decent and it it's got a little port car. And then you get yeah, matches your car. You get like a Tesla <laughs> branded or whatever. And then yeah. you just plug in your heater and it only has to heat. Oh, we're onto something, fellas. Yeah. We are onto yeah, something. Because yeah. yeah. oh, we just extended dad, range. Know, dad's like, always hot. Mom's always cold. You know, that. Oh, uh, yeah, that's does. true. It's even better than the, the separate controls because it's completely directed. This is good. No, All right. It's good. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. So the Humvee, um, then we moved to the States. My dad bought a Jeep. Uh, this was in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Not a whole lot going on in Kansas. So you got six boys in a Jeep. We just went mudding all the time in the Missouri River floodplains. And that's when I decided, yo, I got to work for Jeep at some point. Um, and um, yeah, so that's what I did. And I always made that dream happen. Boys. How many other people, though, as a kid, say something like that? Like, I got to work for Jeep. And then you end yo, up working literally I, on I, your I have Icon forum car. posts. From a flashlight forum I was on when I was a kid. Don't worry about it. Flashlight forum. Um, where I where I literally I wrote in I wrote in the forum, I want to work for Daimler Chrysler someday, which I think is a quote that only I have ever used. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Only you have uttered that statement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so that's wow. my background. I, I was there at Chrysler for a couple of years and then um then I wrote, started writing uh, writing about cars. I, I still think your your story about the starting at Chrysler is just beyond amazing, though. Just real quick, you, you gotta okay, just okay, you okay, gotta, okay. Yeah. okay. So here's the thing: when I was uh, so so when I got to Chrysler, I was 21 years old, and um, uh, I, I was tasked. It was a very weird time. So Fiat Chrysler had just you know, a few years ago, and Fiat had bought Chrysler, and um, and it had become Fiat Chrysler, 
and a the lot merger of equals. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, I was put in charge of uh, designing the architecture for the cooling system for the for the JL Wrangler. And I remember getting there. I'm like, yo, okay, cool, cool. Well, actually, the first thing was my boss said, okay, here are all the programs that we're working on. We got the minivan, we got the new Grand Cherokee, we got the Wrangler, we got the Viper. And this was a small team of five. And he's like, just what do you what do you guys want? And I looked around. I'm like, we're all gonna fight over Viper and and Wrangler, right? And all the other people on my team were like, I don't care, just take whatever you want. I was like, what? Yeah, that makes this is sense. the Motor City. This is you an auto company. How do you not care? Like, how, yeah, do, you how do you care between a Viper and a what a was minivan? The, the minivan, minivan. Yeah. And then exactly. the, the, the KL Cherokee. I'm just like, and then there was the Dart. I'm, I was just like. How is this possible? I'm working yeah. for a car company. How are you guys not just amped? Like, I remember I used to walk through the doors at Chrysler and I, and I just read like a Motor Trend article or something. And I'd be like, yo, did you see that latest road and track or whatever? He's like, uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. I and don't I understand this. This is my mind. I would just, I'm like, I, the whole point of being here is to be surrounded by people who get me. You know, that's the whole point. <laughs> and even at, in Detroit, like, well, suburban Detroit, and like in an automaker, like headquarters for an automaker, I still was a, a black sheep. It was the weirdest thing. That's you know? so strange. Just the idea that someone could be assigned the dart when the Viper and Wrangler on the table and be like, oh, okay, that's great. Instead of just <laughs> leaping out a window immediately is baffling. Well, we are just weirdos. Let's be honest. Like the layperson, if they were to watch this podcast, a layperson, not the car, car person, but the layperson, they'd be like, I don't care. It doesn't matter. But so there's <laughs> yeah. that. But I figured in the car industry. Anyway, so I was put on the Wrangler. Um, and um, and I remember getting there. I was like, okay, cool. I got to make sure the Wrangler doesn't overheat. So the engine, the transmissions, the batteries, everything. And um, and so I, I asked my team, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm new here. How do you design cooling systems for a car? Like, what's the training that you're going to give me? <laughs> good good first question, by the way. Yes. It, it seems like a smart question. <laughs> anyway, it does. they're yeah. like, uh, their response was, um, we're going to need you to figure that out and write it down for us. How? Which I was, don't understand. yeah, it, it, well, it was, there was a strange thing happening. So Chrysler, Chrysler had gone through so many bankruptcies and, and buyouts that a lot of the, the old timers had just said, yo, I'm going to take this buyout. I, I can get another job. And so they took the buyouts, they took their files with them. And during these bankruptcies, so much information was lost that we were like the first round of like of folks writing down how to design cooling systems like how do you design for example how, how do you decide how big of a transmission cooler to put on the wrangler that seems like a pretty important thing you can't have transmissions so. overheating off road how are there no records of this how come there weren't file cabinets with drawings and dude shit like there that? was nothing there At you know what there point, was there are computers which typically retain information <laughs> yeah well i don't know what happened i can tell you what there was is there were People and, and also part of the problem, not just the file retention problem. At Chrysler, there's this thing, there's this like sort of initiative. After a couple of years in one department, employees are really pushed to move on to the next thing. So the so the old timer who's been designing radiators since 1975, he doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, and, and so like, what I had to do is basically run around the company and ask, "Hey, did you ever work in, a, in the aerothermal department? What about you? What about you? How did you do this?" <laughs> And it wasn't just me, of course. Find that old guy? Oh, we found a couple of old guys. Yeah, really yeah. smart. Uh, yeah, but you know, it was a team of us, like writing down, like here's how you do this stuff. So, like future engineers, like don't redo this. Like don't, you know, uh, yeah, um, reinvent the wheel. So yeah, that was nuts. That was crazy. And you're 21 doing this. That's that's this is a you know people have these impressions right that uh, auto manufacturing big companies are just filled with geniuses knowing exactly what to do. You know what's that supposed to mean? Point. What's that supposed to mean, Bo? What what's that supposed to mean? <laughs> Nothing. Just, I mean, people who maybe have done it before, before okay. putting Dude, a mass market. How, how do we have all these quality problems? And then you actually go to like manufacturing and go, oh, geez, how are there so few? You I know? feel like I all to, of this. I got to be honest. Yes. I have to be honest. I, is, this is not a feeling that only I have. This is a feeling that many, many, many engineers in the auto industry have. I genuinely, genuinely, for over a year, probably the, most of the time I was there, I couldn't believe that a vehicle was actually going to roll off the assembly line. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's not even a joke. I, I literally, there, like, the whole time I was like, "There's no, like, I don't understand. We're launching in two and a half years. I don't know how this is going to happen." 
And, and it's not just me. It's a feeling that so many engineers have. And the reality is there is the launch date and that is the date and it's going to happen. And you just hope that you guys can somehow build enough safety factors in place and figure out, you know, hope you don't make too many late changes because those are expensive and just somehow get something off the line. It's, is there a mad scramble at the end or does it just kind of happen? I wasn't there at the end, <laughs> but I'm God, sort of glad I well, was. Well, you know all those product launches, it's like, oh shit, it's due tomorrow, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, all of this That's I feel like ties into, day, yeah. it ties into like this bigger feeling I've had ever, you know, ever since I've become an adult, which is the realization that adulthood is really kind of a myth. It's kind of just this bill of goods we sell kids. Like I always expected there'd be some moment where you're going to be an adult and everything clicks and like, okay, now I'm not stupid anymore. And I do rational things and I could pay attention to boring <laughs> stuff. And it never, it didn't happen. I'm no. 51 and it never happened. I don't get it. And I feel like we're doing children a disservice by pretending like it's a real thing. But no, everybody's, we're all kind of idiots and we're still running the world. And that's just what's going on. And Same it, brain, it, just everything hurts. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Same. Oh, man. It's alarming. Unless you're David is, what, 24 now? I don't know. Yeah, he's 24. What? Too. No, I'm an old man. I'm, 30, I'm almost 31. Yeah, so Bo, I'm I assume Bo, Bo, you, you see the industry from a vantage point that even I didn't, I, you know, I, I, you know, it, in the engineering team, you're kind of like cordoned off into the dark basement. Actually at Chrysler, it literally was the engineers were in this gray cubicle yeah. farm. And then you'd go, you go to the designers to, you know, try to argue for more grill opening. And I'm telling you, there were windows and like paint oh, yeah. and like <laughs> people were wearing like colors and like scarves. And, uh, and I was just like, Oh, and there were women and it was just like what is this place <laughs> it, it's like the pd the product design office it, it, it was like it was like heaven it really was every time i <laughs> i went in there i was just like oh my gosh what is this place but okay, oh. that, that's so true because i've been down like in the bowels of like, like ford's you know product development and you go down the stairs and down the stairs, and I couldn't believe it. All of these manhole. offices <laughs> with no windows, they're little tiny things, like people working away in there. I'm like, this is like horrifying. And you're right, <laughs> you go upstairs, the designers, they're around the courtyard, they got the big windows, all the beautiful pictures up. Yeah, we like hanging out with those guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, like hanging out. I will say many of the engineers, if you, if you said, hey, do you guys, do you want some windows and paintings? They say, what, what do I need that for? I'm yeah, no, they get in the way I'm of the food to troughs. Yes. But I just go to the food troughs for the feed, uh, windows are going to distract just, me. I'd rather have an IV drip. Half of them would rather yeah. just have an <laughs> IV, an drip, IV drip so they don't have to deal with it. <laughs> Terrible. Okay, so when you went to argue to designers for things like we need more grill opening or whatever, how often did that work? How often were you able to convince them of that kind of thing? Uh, look, design rules all. I was going to really? say the engineers always won. Huh, so no. the design has priority. I mean, the designers are just blaming the engineers for their crappy design <laughs> once it's done, you know. No. You get these concept cars, every line is beautiful and perfect, and then all the compromises happen because of the engineers, not for nothing. Well, there, there, there is going to be some compromise. <laughs> has to be. But I have to say, more often than not, design wins. And actually, wow. I have to say, even as an engineer, I think that's how it should be. It should be. Because des design is so important. You've got to get engineers to just figure it out, make this car look like I want it to look because that's what's going to sell it. Yeah. Now at um, the same time, form follows function. Well, in yeah. testing, but... I guess you're going to find out the parts that are just don't make sense as yeah. you test it. Well, I mean, at the same, I got to be clear, like if something is physically impossible, you can make the case like, you know, we need to have some grill opening because, you know, it's just things, like, some things are just a requirement. But, you know, pushing engineers, is that's, that's a big part of what designers do. It's like, this is the goal. Try to make it happen. And many, I got to say, a lot of engineers kind of like that, like, like that challenge. Yeah, mm -hmm. I could see it. Well, you even, even on the, the Wrangler that you worked on, David, if I remember, you were telling me you have a mesh inside the seven slot grill. And then yeah. when they did the Gladiator, they actually had to get rid of it for extra cooling for the ones that tow or no? So back when we were working on it, there was no mesh whatsoever. And we were we were asking designers, please do not put any grill texture in here. We want wide open slots like on the Wrangler because we're yeah. so marginal on cooling anyway. <laughs> now the, 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 the actual vehicle comes out with mesh. And I'm like, okay, 
somewhere there must have been some, you know, during testing, they must have found out, okay, actually, we've got a little more capacity than we thought we can, we can put some mesh in there, or, or so, I don't know how it went, ultimately. Uh, but yeah, no, it's... Um, was there like that, a, a major, like, nationwide recall on your work? Like, God, the, and they call it like the, the Tracy uh, cooling system? <laughs> I will say there's a lot of Tracy recall, you know, 400,000 recall because of the cooling system. David, oh, David would be beside himself if that happened. He would not be sleeping, even though he doesn't work there anymore. Well, there was, there is a lot, there are a lot of complaints about the the fan, the 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 noise, the fan noise, and that's that's happening because the HVAC demand, AC demands, like it's not. So the weird thing, the way Chrysler was really set up when I was there was really confusing. The HVAC team was separate from the cooling team, but what made sense was that the cooling team and the aero team had been brought under one because they're they're so like inter- intermingled. Yeah. HVAC was its own thing. Uh, uh, yeah, it was an interesting team, and, and the, but the powertrain team was completely different from the vehicle team, which That's and weird. and and their timeline was different. They had a different timeline. So the powertrain team they're working on this two liter that's going to go into the Wrangler. They're on a separate timeline than the vehicle itself. I'm just like, how does this make sense? Everybody in the whole company was like, none of this makes any. I don't understand. I don't understand why this is the case, <laughs> but they just rolled with it. But that that that's why Chrysler is so charming, though, isn't it? Yeah, I, it I is. agree. They, they, they the, just that whole kind of uh, cowboy. I don't know. I don't know that 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 kind of just figure I out mean, on the run how to make it uh, work. Uh, the, the, power train that. team being on it's a different chances. schedule is okay if the schedule is earlier. Like if you get the engine done first, that's fine. But if the, if the engine becomes something the dealers have to put in, then everybody's screwed up. Or the customer. Think about this. That think, about, think about this. I'm trying to figure out how, like what size a grill opening needs to be on a vehicle. I don't even yeah. know what, how much heat the engine puts out yet because it's not even developed oh, yet. Oh my god! It's like it's like. But here's the thing: Chrysler was an incredible place to start my career because there was so much responsibility as a young person. Yeah. Which is something yeah. that like I wasn't just designing widgets and doorknobs. Like it was, no. it was awesome. And the, there's so much engineering talent there. Um, to, what to an just amazing experience. Though, like pick, yeah. 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 Just to have that like thrown in your lap and having to figure it out. That's phenomenal. And this also, we should also, uh, if we do a part where we ask people's opinions, David, you should ask the question, should you own a car that you designed a major part of? Like, I feel like you should at some point in your life own uh, that Wrangler because you designed the cooling system. You that should have cool. one. I think so. Okay. It's not to be new, though. Yeah. I mean, because I, I played a role in designing the, the cooling system. I Good want to role. be clear on that. Yeah. Uh, we had a all great you. Team all yours. Yeah. <laughs> just no. Just at David. some point, at some point, I, I, I'll buy a JL. No doubt. No doubt. All right. Bo, Bo, you, you, so, Bo, you see the auto industry from a vantage point that I've never seen it from, and Jason has never seen it from. So I grew up with a, with, with, kind, with a pretty weird vantage point and a, and a wonderful one, actually, because, uh, you, you know, my uh, my dad started at Galpin in 1953, actually started at Nash Glendale in the car business in 1952. So this is his 70th year in the car business. So I, I grew up on a showroom floor. Uh, but what's really amazing and, and, and a blessing for me is that uh, it was at Galpin and it wasn't just your typical dealership. So first of all, my parents and, and dad from day one was always into serving customers and doing the right things. And that's how you built the business, yada, yada. But also they, they had fun with things. So we were, you know, galpinizing cars. We were into performance. Uh, back before I was born, uh, we were into NASCAR racing. We won the West Coast NASCAR championship for four years you in a row. You made rumble seats and Mustangs. We were, we, that's, uh, we were customizing cars actually <laughs> since 1952. I think we were the first dealership to really customize a new car the way that we did completely uh, uh, the whole thing and, and to sell to a customer. And the idea was what's next year's car going to look like? And that was a 1952 Ford Custom, it was called the Galpin Custom, and it actually premiered at the same show that the Hero Hata Merc premiered at, uh, at the Pan Pacific Auditorium. So we did the galpinizing and customizing, you know, for, gosh, 70 years now. And that's what I grew up on. So on the showroom floor, we always had these, you know, wild paint jobs and trucks that were lifted and, and you know, uh, all kinds of performance things. And to me, like a stock car, like never looked finished. You know what I mean? Because we were always into customizing, galpinizing uh, everything that we got. So that's kind of how I grew up. Um, 
you know, I was still in uh, uh, high school, I think, when I, you know, I worked at the dealership in every different department. I sold cars for years. Uh, I, you know, worked uh, worked my way up uh, all the way through the different jobs here. So. Uh, then got on different committees uh, over at Ford. So almost 20 years ago, I got on Ford's product committee. So we look at everything from sometimes starting off as a sketch all the way through production. Uh, but it's really fun because I get to watch the whole you know product development and uh, and work with everything from the designers from exterior to color and trim to the engineering um, and uh, basically uh, everything uh, uh, in between. So that's that's kind of my fun and joy and. I don't know. I've just always been into cars. My uh, grandmother, strangely, had a um, a green Mercedes. It was a 1965 green over green, which was my favorite color, by the way, uh, uh, Mercedes 220 SE. And she used to drive it uh, from Arkansas out here. And I always like I remember that car like driving up in the driveway and I loved it so much. And she had a little Chihuahua Fifi that would come up and, and bark. <laughs> And that was the first car I got. So I inherited that after she passed away. And then that became the first car I got to galvanize. So I did it, I blacked it all out. Uh, it's actually got a leopard skin interior, did you know, all the audio video stuff. No, no engine work, thank God, I was only 16. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, that's uh, my brief background. And uh, I've just been fortunate to be in this business. And then pretty soon I started loving uh, all kinds of weird and wonderful cars because I was always kind of exposed to that and got into you know like Big Daddy Roth and George Barris, a lot of the classic customizers, and um, you now the rest is kind of history. And you know here here we are. And I never forget uh, uh, reading about uh, uh, Jason for the first time because uh, it, it was about the Beetle and and you losing you know that Beetle. And I remember reading about it oh, when yeah. he got it back. I was like, oh, right. dude, he got his Beetle back. That's so exciting. <laughs> And then uh, you came to Galpin the first time when we had yep. uh, we built the Skyliner, which was the conversion van built like a you know like a jet kind of thing. Very and cool. uh, I'll never forget because because Torch walks up and uh, we had uh, Von Dutch's toad there, and, and he goes, "Is that a?" And I'm doing all these interviews, talking to all these people about this you know van and all this goofy stuff that we're talking about, you know. And uh, he comes up with this, "Is that a? Is that an Isetta engine in that thing?" And I'm like. <laughs> That's the first interesting question I got all day. Yes, yes, it is. Like, how do you know that? And you know, and then I'm like, oh, dude, you're the guy with the beetle. That's so cool. You've got it back. So, I, that's kind of how we started off too. So. Yeah, that was. So, yeah, that's, that's how I knew. History. Yep, and that's how I knew Bo was was the right kind of guy, and uh, and I always knew that like if um, and Bo and I had you know then we started working together on other like car history projects and interesting yeah. things. Bo of course does a lot of TV, and I would do some research for him, and we'd always talk about interesting cars, and we'd always wanted to do kind of more projects together. I so, briefly had a TV show on Discovery. It was yes. awesome. It was it was it was great. great. The timing didn't work out so great. I'm going to blame timing and not, not ratings. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, the first person I thought of when we're writing things was Torch, because like, you, know, you know, some of this stuff, you, you know, it can be a little dry, you know, uh, you know, and uh, when you add add Torch to it, it definitely brings it to life. So we, oh. we had a lot of fun. You know, uh, it was uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. And Bo always had interest. His taste in cars is something I always respected. A lot of people who collect cars, they I feel like they waste their time. They just get like fancy stuff. Bo's collection is interesting and eclectic and it ranges. He's got, you know, he's got um, like a, he's got Messerschmitts and he's got like micro cars and he has these amazing like one offs, the amazing shooting brakes that Aston shoot. Like the variety of stuff he's got in there is astounding and it's so good. And the Bollet, like, so oh, and you can stuff. and you can all expect to see more of it as time yes. goes on and we tell the stories behind these cars. We're all really pumped. For that, that Hannah Mag. Awesome. Does your Hannah Mag, the Comus brought, does that run, by the way, Bo? We did get it running kind of barely. Uh, yeah. You know, to kind of, and then we towed it a little bit just so it looked like it ran. Um, <laughs> but uh, we got to get that thing going, man. We do, because that's time. that's an important car, I feel like not it enough really people is. know about. And there's so much good stuff. I was but, so yeah. geeked out. I was at uh, 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 Wolfsburg uh, at the museum there. Have you been oh. there? 
It's yes, they have, a, they have a beautiful Comus Bra. Oh, and, and I just yeah. completely, you know, all these like gorgeous cars, and I completely freaked out over the Hannah Mag. And I was <laughs> oh. like, that is the ugliest thing. I'm like, no, they've oh. got a Hannah Mag. This is no. so cool. <laughs> the Hannah Mag is a big deal. And that one they have, I know the one at Wolfsburg, and it is stunning. It is a beautiful one. Why is it a big deal, Jason? Stuff. Why is it a big well, deal? The Hannah Mag, okay, arguably, Hannah Mag was maybe the you're one of the europe one of europe's first people's car you could trace beetle origins i think all the way back to the hannah mag if you really wanted to yeah. it was in like the 20s it was an incredibly minimal car one of the first to have uh an envelope body, body like body not car. not yeah it's almost unibody blanche yeah. uh lancha lambda i think was the first but it had like a envelope body where the set fenders yeah. weren't separate um uh -huh. And it, so that, they call it a comus brat because as a German, you must know, that means like a bread loaf, like a soldier's bread loaf. So brought for comus brot. brat. Oh, oh brot. brot. Yeah, like it, 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 the name comes because it oh, looks totally like a loaf of bread right. they would serve soldiers because it's all like one unified piece, which wasn't common. And it was huh. very crude and dirt cheap. And a lot of important people in the car uh, who went on to do all kinds of important cars kind of broke their teeth on the... or cut their teeth on the comus brought initially it's just a fascinating teeth. little yeah, car if it's, it's german so misbrot they probably broke their teeth i mean you know, <laughs> yeah, hard probably did break. and it's got so, one beautiful cyclops headlight yes oh and there's a racing one like a famous racing one you see where the body oh, is yeah. all wicker it's like a wicker body. How cool it's a wicker that? bodied car because the engine makes like eight horsepower or whatever oh also david speaking of bring that up on a screen and show you know what's crazy about this car yeah we should bring all these up so the cooling fan runs on a shaft that goes through the radiator the radiator oh. has a hole in it the wow. shaft goes through it and then it's spinning it's bonkers i don't know That's... why that was a good solution but uh, apparently it was i drove the one lane has a nice one they let me drive oh, yeah. i find it really I don't know. There's that's a there's a lot of interesting character to that car, and it's it's important. I feel like Americans don't really get it, but we'll we'll change that. We'll let them. Uh, but but it is it's incredibly important, and yeah. uh, like I said, one of the first people's cars of uh, well, yeah. in Europe, if not the first. Yeah, I mean, you could argue Austin Seven also and some other ones, yeah. but there's something about this one that's even more minimal. And what's interesting about it, it was in no way a scaled down bigger car. It was very much a clean sheet. Like we have a really limited set of resources to work with. Let's not look at how cars are usually built. What can we do here? And that's why everything is a little bit different. And, and what else was Hannah Mog uh, uh, making? Because they had big like tanks and all kinds of stuff. Well, they right? and they made a lot of big passenger cars too. They made like. Um, you know, I think even some kind of higher end uh, passenger cars. Hannah Mag was a big, they were a big company back in the day. Uh, Comus brought was, I think, a, a departure for them, though. And I think that was, it was like in the 20s. So I think things were kind of lean times in Germany, uh, like post-depression, you know, like global depression kind of era. So people needed, it kind of also, you know, prefigured micro cars that would come after World War II. Mm -hmm. It's a, a ton of, very interesting so car. By the way, David, where are you in Germany? I don't mean where the room is. Are you in like a, a the Taco Bell bathroom over there or something? And this is not a Taco Bell. <laughs> that is a bathroom, but it's not in the Taco Bell. You are in the bathroom. I knew it. <laughs> no, no, that's a bathroom. I'm not in a bathroom. I'm, I'm in like a little, uh, little like um, in a room above my parents' garage. All right. um, like the Fonz again. We're talking about yeah. the Fonz yet again. German Fonz. Yep. I'm, um, I'm near Nuremberg. I'm oh, rolling in my diesel manual Chrysler Voyager, which is... Uh, <laughs> A vehicle that I'm just obsessed with because it's, it's nobody understands this. I, yeah, right. I, no matter how I, I just want to tell people about this vehicle's just incredible, just skill at just being a vehicle, but no one cares. <laughs> None I of respect them. that. The, all of them are just like it's, it's a minivan. Skill in being a vehicle, right? It what does exactly the job. Does that mean? I think I see where you're going. It's, no, no, no. Hear me out here. People and stuff from one place to another, and it does. And that's it gets what it does. It, so it gets 32 miles per gallon. It's seat seven. Yeah. It's got a stick shift, so this is kind of interesting. A turbo, it's turbocharged, oh, okay. turbo diesel. It's oh, it's just such a great vehicle. Oh, the engine's right. cool too, Bo. The For engine a has... European road trip car. I drove this thing from Germany to Istanbul, well, seven hours east of Istanbul, almost, almost in Syria, actually. You really from hate Germany, yourself, don't you? <laughs> there and all the way back. And not only not only did it make it there and back, it actually got in better shape while I was because because in um in uh, where was itself. I in Serbia I got some Serbian refrigerant pumped into that AC system 
and the, the vehicle actually the best returned. refrigerant in the world survey <laughs> refrigerant right. oh, ask for it by the way next time you go to your auto parts <laughs> store some, it was some back alley refrigerant he just you know it, he just popped his car and he just shoved the refrigerant in no one looked i get, get quick quickly gave him a couple euro and off i went and um yeah the vehicle's great oh, i just love it i'm sad i love it. so the engine has separate cylinder heads so it's like it's what it's a four or six david it's a four-cylinder via Matori. It's, it's renowned for being a total piece of crap. Luckily, <laughs> mine was replaced in 2009, and um, that's why the vehicle has 260,000 miles on it. I just love the the separate cylinder heads, just something you hardly ever see on car engines. Planes, I, I hear, use it. Piston planes. But All it right, just we got to stop so with weird. the band. We're going to lose right. Bo here. We're going to lose no, Bo. No, okay. no, no. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about uh, your, your self-loathing and torturing yourself driving this through. Where the hell did you take it again? Um, I took, it was absolute garbage. I, so I drove it to, I, I, on Google maps, it, it was like, okay, well there's Istanbul, here's Germany. And in the U S you get this idea, like, okay, this thing's at, you know, California or Utah is, you know, a couple thousand miles. It says that's what, you know, 20 hours, whatever, just 20 hours. You just bomb it. You know, you just, you do it in three days, right? Eight, you know, seven, eight hour days, no problem. But things change when you're especially when you're leaving the Schengen area, when, when you've got border, you know, checkpoints, like the distance and the time, there's like not a whole lot of correlation there anymore. Like each checkpoint I went through was three hours of literally sitting completely still. Whoa. I've never seen a bigger line of, of cars in traffic in my whole life than between uh, Serbia and Bulgaria. These checkpoints were three hours in 105 degree weather, no AC on the way there. And, uh, and it and took me forever. Communist guards that are are there. you are you turning the cars off? Like, do people turn their cars off, or they just let them idle for three hours? Um, a lot of one hundred and five degree heat. I bet they left them on if they had AC. A lot, well, you know what? A lot of people. I don't remember what I did. I, I left mine on for a lot of it, but a lot of people just let. Honestly, a lot of people just got out of their cars and like had like picnics in the in the <laughs> line. It was. Wow. Yeah, why not? It was strange. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I have an extremely high threshold for, for, yeah. uh, for Bo, just pain, discomfort. D but this doesn't even register in like top ten of David discomfort drives. Like the 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 <laughs> minivan is a plush. It's like a it's like a, a five star hotel compared to some of the crap he's he slept in. Like that you saw that you saw the postal jeep, what that thing was, right? Oh. And he slept in that for he like a week straight. That? Yes, cop stopped him. Because he passed out at a gas station. I love this story. Tell this story, David, because this is one of my favorites. Yes. I love this one. Okay, I'll try to make it brief, okay? I was coming back from Utah Good. in this postal Jeep that I had been driving. Which is just for. a rusty box, by the way. There's no door panels. There's no carpet. It's Jason. a rusty <laughs> box. Now, how go fast ahead. does this rusty box go? I was doing about 55. Uh, in the flattest parts of Kansas, I was doing 60. No problem. Huh? Okay. That's anyway, it wasn't too bad. I did, was not on the highway, just the back roads. And um, I had just made it with my brothers to Utah from Michigan. And I was on my way back. It was all by myself. And I was doing that classic, you know, wake up in the morning and just bomb as late as you can, as many miles as you possibly can. The thing that with EVs is going to be a little tricky, but the thing that we Americans are used to, like, oh, that's only 12 hours. We'll get there tonight. Like that idea. Anyway, so that's what I was doing. I was in this postal Jeep on the right side of the vehicle. And to save time, I basically, I was just wearing my pajamas. And what would happen is I would just, uh, I would just drive until I got tired. And then I would just turn the car off and then just fall asleep. And then I would wake up. Do you call them jammies? Your jammies? Uh, <laughs> my pajamas. And then I would just fire it up and then just drive another day. And um, anyway, so I was in, actually in Michigan already. I pulled up to a gas station because I was running out of fuel and I got to a pump, turned the car off and just immediately fell asleep because I was so <laughs> tired. Um, in your jam still? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And, and the, the Jeep was just filled with all my stuff. Um, anyway, so five minutes <laughs> later from my power nap, I wake up and I see a, a person on the other side of the pump and I'm like, hey, how you doing? And he's like, um, I just called the police on you. It's like, that's a weird greeting. And, uh, <laughs> and then he just leaves. He just bounces. I'm like, I guess the police is coming. I don't know. So I, whatever, I just go, go to fill up the, the Jeep and the Jeep has this horizontal spout in the back for some reason. I don't know. And I was debating if, I, if the police is actually coming, should I wait to fill it up? Anyway, so I go to fill this thing up 
And just as uh, uh, we get to full and all the gas spews out of the horizontal spout, <laughs> the police shows up and they see me in my pajamas, clearly haggard. I've been sleeping in this freaking rusty chip box for the last like four days. <laughs> and they're just so confused. They don't understand. They don't know what to do. They're like, have you been living in this thing? I'm like, I'm not living in it. They're like, where are you coming from? Do you live around here? I'm just you like, kind of were living in it for a few days at least. Yeah, a couple weird, days. I mean, you were not living in it. Yes. At the same time. Exactly. And when I told them I was coming from Utah, they were just like, I don't know what to do here. Like, wh <laughs> what they did is they just said, okay, just go to the parking lot over there and just like sleep for some amount of time. I think the cop would be like, I feel like I should be tasering you just on principle. So please. <laughs> yeah, <host."> right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, for this story to make sense, you have to see the vehicle in question because it is truly, it is a cartoon of a vehicle. It's, yeah. yeah, it's absurd. It's a rusty cube full of like a sleeping litter that David had inside of like old newspapers and rags. And yeah, it's- weird. Again, the why, you just, you just- Why did that guy not knock on the window though? That's the real question. Yeah. Who just calls the cops on somebody? You know what, if there was a lot of debate in the comments section on Jalopnik about this. And a lot of people said, well, it's too dangerous to knock on a window. And I'm, you know what I think? That's you bullshit. Know, that is if bullshit. you think I'm if you think I'm ill or something, like oh, help your yeah. fellow person, you know? Did he right. think you just died there? Like what was he think? Like you weren't well, a not threat. If he was calling the cops, right? I mean, so yeah, unless you were goes, moving in who, next door to him, you're okay, not a threat to here's him. Here's the question. Who goes from fully capable of driving a totally like unstable, narrow yeah, shit box to clearly unconscious. like unconscious it's just not possible <laughs> there's gonna be some amount of like interim time where there's like loss of control like i pull up perfectly to a gas pump and shut the come on and just guy. off and out <laughs> i would have called the cops too yeah, yeah. You know, that's fair. <laughs> anyway, i think i would have knocked to the window at least just to see if you were dead Thanks so much for sitting through and enduring the Autopian podcast. We are delighted to have you, and we'll see you next week. Bye.